we thank you for this gracious moment, this moment that we can be here as a spiritual family to focus on you, to read your word, and to learn the many things that are taught in the Bible, to apply them to our minds and to our hearts. And we also ask that you help us to focus on Mitch tonight when he's teaching us, to learn what he wants to teach us and to apply that in our lives. We ask that you look over those who have had surgeries recently and please help them to recover quickly and for the process not to be too painful. And we ask that you look over the Frenches as they're traveling and help them to get back safely. Please look over those who will be traveling this weekend and please help them to get to their destination safely as well. And we especially thank you, Lord, for your son's sacrifice and all that that means. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here with you tonight as we continue our study of God's saving grace. If you recall, the last um, several weeks, we've been kind of building a foundation as our study of God's saving grace. We've talked about things like definitions, doctrine of saving grace. <clears throat> last week, we talked about access to saving grace. How do we actually come into contact with God's grace? And so we want to keep building that foundation, and tonight, we're going to um, take a look at living by law versus living by grace and seeing the difference between those two, those two approaches to serving God. And so um, to begin, I just want to bring to memory the story of Linda. So remember a few weeks back, I think it was three weeks back, and it's not Linda Perkins. Sorry, Linda. Um, Linda is just any Christian, right? It's, it's a fictional character. It can be a male, female, young or old. But you remember she had a problem. And um, she was trying to justify herself before God through all of her works, works of, of faith. And it led to frustrations, guilt, doubt, and resentment in her life. And it's really not supposed to be that way, right? I mean, God's, God's word is meant to provide spiritual solutions, not problems. And so I, I, I think about Jesus when he um, had finished his discourse with the rich young ruler, and as he went away disappointed, he talked to his disciples, and he said this, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples' answer was, well, who can be saved? And in Matthew <clears throat> chapter 19 and verse 26, and looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Trying to serve God in our way, trying to justify ourselves by our works, it's impossible. It's like putting a camel through the eye of a needle. But with God and his grace, his saving grace, all things are possible. And so um, we... We really can't enjoy God's saving grace if we have a mindset that we rectify our sins or make ourselves right before God through, through law-keeping, through good works, through church attendance, through prayers. Um, pick any Christian service that you want, thinking that somehow more law-keeping is the answer to all of our law-breaking. That's just not um, how God's grace works. In fact, God will not give help to anyone who refuses to trust in his ability to save somebody. So think about that. Um, God will not give help to anyone who refuses to trust in his ability to save someone. Um, in a sense, God is saying this when you do that, that your attempt to save yourself is hopeless until you come to me fully believing 
that I am your only hope of salvation, you will die in your sins. And so when we talk about saving grace, it's very important that we don't develop this mindset because in effect, we'll, we'll see a little bit later, we, we start to nullify the effect of grace. Um, probably unintentionally in how we try to serve God, but trying to serve him through doing more works on ourselves, putting more pressure on ourselves, we in effect nullify his grace. See, the problem with Linda is she's trying to save herself and she does not fully trust in God's grace. And that's really the basis for the lesson this evening. A couple of reasons. Uh, maybe one is she's too proud to admit that she really fully depends on God. And that sounds kind of funny, but have you ever felt that way? Too proud to really admit how dependent we are upon God because we like to be independent. And so that mindset even though it sounds foreign to us, it can creep into our service as Christians. And it can just be simply not really understanding how God's grace works. And so we want to, we want to look at that tonight as well. The key to Linda's problem is found in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. When Paul, writing to the Galatian Christians who were going back to the old law, looking to justify themselves through that law, he says, you've been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. So law really generically, in this sense, it refers to the old law. But really, you think about it, law really generically refers to any, any system that relies on human efforts for um, justification rather than God's divine grace. That's really what it is. So it can apply, it certainly applied to the Christians then, but we have God's law today, right? the New, New Testament, and we can almost treat it like, like, um, like the Christians did back in that time. Law has a place. It justifies the perfect law keeper. So if you have a law and you keep it perfectly, then that law justifies you. It makes you right, innocent, and just. And so if you can follow all of God's commandments, uh, everything that he laid down for you, then the law will justify you. But the law will do nothing more than that. Um, and for us, it convicts us because we know from Romans 3.23 that we've all sinned. And we know deep down that we all sinned, even though we, we, de we dedicate ourselves to God and we love Christ, right? We still sin. And so we know that. Where do we place our trust? I think that's an important question to ask. Where do we place our trust? In our own law keeping, do we kind of get emboldened as a Christian and feel good about the laws that we keep? And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but do we put our trust more in that than we do in God's grace? Do we, um, in our own law keeping, do we appeal to Christ and try to show him and, and, and get his approval? to show our works, and, and do we appeal to him for his approval through our law-keeping, or do we just simply trust in God's grace to cover our shortcomings and our failings? Because we really don't like to think about our shortcomings and our failings. We like to think about the things that we do for God. And when we think about that all the time, it starts to lead to this mentality that, that that's where my strength is. That's where my trust is. It's in me, and it's not in God. You see, God's law really is not the problem. Our sin against God's law is the problem. Guilt can't be removed by more law-keeping. We can't somehow justify ourselves before God by attending more, praying more, going to more Bible studies, visiting the sick more, but somehow we're going to be better in God's sight um, that he'll overlook my sin. Any sin really separates us from God. James 2.10 talks about that. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. So we know that. We understand that concept, right? If we sin, we're, we're guilty. We don't stand justified before God. Once we're guilty, we can't be justified by our own efforts. So faith is necessary 
in order to address the problem, but divine grace is necessary in order to solve the problem. So there's two things, right? There's faith and there's grace. Our faith addresses the problem that we have with God, our sin problem. But God's grace is actually the solution to the problem, not our continual building up of our works. And we will talk more and more in this class about faith, and we're going to talk a little bit more about faith a little bit later, about some of the characteristics of faith. Yes, it's obedience, but it's more than that. It's also trust. We'll talk some more about that. So living by law, this law-keeping scenario that we talk about for Linda, it may sound a little foreign to us because I think, by and large, we all, um, we all understand, at least at a, at a pretty high level, God's grace, the importance of it. We talk about it. Um, we speak about it. We sing about it. We pray about it. But um, a lot of times, I don't think we really feel the power of it in our lives as we should. And many good and well-intentioned Christians will um, live life, kind of, kind of live their lives a little bit in this pattern of law-keeping and not relying on God's grace. And maybe that's a product of our teaching. Um, we teach a lot about faith and following God's commandments, and it's important to do that. But we don't really teach a whole lot about grace, at least beyond just salvation. And I'm referring back to my experience here in other places, that it's just not a subject that's really talked about a whole lot. But when we compare the two in power and scope, God's grace is so much more powerful and so much in our faith. Uh, we do a terrible injustice if we don't really study and appreciate God's grace and the importance of it in our lives as Christians. So, um, living by law. So let's look at Let's look at some of the characteristics of that. So living by law, <clears throat> we believe in God, but with maybe a measure of reservation. We know we need God, but not in the way that we should need him. And then God is somebody that we need to please with service and good works, not somebody to love, surrender to, and be fully dependent on. And we'll talk a little bit later about how it's, it's difficult sometimes in the world that we live in, we're measured and graded and evaluated in everything we do. And sometimes we follow that mentality in our service to God. Um, that maybe he's somebody that we just need to serve versus somebody that we need to surrender to. And, and how that makes God's commandments that's not a burden but it's a privilege. And this really describes Linda. This is where she's at and in her problem. And if we're honest with ourselves, maybe at some level, this can describe us at certain times in our lives. When we get discouraged and we're really focusing on where we're at spiritually, certainly we need to evaluate that, you know, compare to God's word. But um, we don't need to stuff God's grace down and just and focus on what I need to do. Maybe what we need to do is just, instead of trying to do more works, is just appreciate God's grace and surrender to that and really meditate on what that means because then our actions are, start to fall in line as, as to how they should. So any thoughts at all as we talk about this? David. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah. No, it's a great, a great example. Yeah. 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 No, I think, and I appreciate your comment. That's a great comparison of Christ and the church, husband and a wife. How God's love is always faithful, right? So the dysfunction that can happen in marriage, marriage is when husband first doesn't love his wife, then says submit, right? Well, I mean, that's, that's tough to love and submit to. So, but God is always faithful, but we're kind of the other spouse that even with God's love, we still kind of want to rebel, right? And God's love is perfect. So thank you. I appreciate it. Um, any other thoughts before we move on? So I want to compare this, this rigid and unworkable system of um, living by law to, to the gospel's prescription of living by grace. And so this will introduce a new character, and her name is Frances. So again, you know, nobody in particular could be a, a male or female, young or old, but we'll call her Frances, right? So Frances doesn't see God as a master who reaps where he doesn't sow. Um, she sees him as a merciful and forgiving father who sent his son out of heaven to atone for her sins. So um, a mindset, right? An attitude. She knows God chastises her and disciplines her, but he does so out of love to not lose her. And we, we read kind of from the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12. And um, missed a slide there. This is what Linda... Living by law, let's just go through that real quick. Linda believes consciously or not, right? If I pray enough, if I study enough, if I pay enough, if I help enough, if I attend enough, if I forgive enough, then I'll be justified before God and he will admit me to heaven. So um, have you ever thought that way before? Or maybe a little bit like that? Um, that's the mindset. That's what it looks like. Um, if I do enough, God will admit me to heaven. And so contrast that with living by grace. Okay? Let's, let's kind of see a different approach. God chastises us because he loves us. He doesn't want to lose us. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 11. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure, for God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you were without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respect them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share in his holiness. That's the purpose, that God does that. All discipline for the moment seems, to be, seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. In, the, in Revelation 3, verse 19, the, um, the Apostle John writes, those whom I love, or Jesus says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. So we can see the theme, right? That's what God does. That's what any parent does. Any parent that truly loves their child, they're going to discipline them because they don't want them to be lost, right? And so God being the father, the greatest father of all, that's how he deals with us. It's not a master who reaps where he doesn't sow. It's a loving father who disciplines his children so that they don't, they don't lose. Um, they don't lose themselves to the world. So um, 
Francis knows God expects obedience, but also provides a means to compensate for her weakness and failure. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So if we're walking in Christ, if we're living in faith, and we're in the light, all of those things, we will sin. But it says here, uh, the Apostle John says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. So Francis understands that. He understands that she's going to fail at times. It's not, it's not something that she can really help. It's, it's our human nature. But God is there to forgive through his grace. It doesn't mean that she has to do extra work to compensate for the sin. God's grace is there to take care of the sin. Francis doesn't see God's commandments as burdensome, but rather as refreshing and giving direction for her soul and her life. So think about that. You can think about God's commandments in two different ways, right? Now they're a burden. They, they put limits on me. Or you can say, you know what, they're very refreshing. They give, they give me direction for my soul and for my life. And um, that comes from an attitude of submission out of love versus um, obligation or versus compliance out of obligation. So submission from love versus um, compliance from obligation. Going back to what David said, right? Um, that's the difference. So living by law, it's kind of compliance, right? Is compliance a really warm, fuzzy word? To me, compliance is pretty just strict. I mean, I will comply. Uh, and it has in it kind of a sense of like, I don't really like this, but I will comply. Um, but submission is a whole other word, right? That means that maybe I don't agree, but I'm going to submit my will. And I'm going to trust. So one is based on trust. The other one is based on force, right? Police officer comes and says, get on the ground. I'm going to comply. Um, and probably submit, too. <laughs> But I think you can see the difference, right? There's a difference in the approach and how you think about God and serving God. Christina. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it's that way as Christians. When we become Christians, we sort of learn to comply, but then we come into more appreciation for God and his love, and it changes, right? So that's a great point. Appreciate you bringing that up. Um, Francis worships God from her heart out of love and adoration rather than out of habit or duty. So have you ever worshiped God out of habit or duty? I mean... I think I probably have, right? But that's where we need to stop and think about why am I here to worship God? Is it out of love and adoration or is it Wednesday night at 7 and I need to be here or Sunday at picture service, right? 9, 30, 11, um, Sunday evening, 5 p.m. or maybe a gospel meeting or whatever. Denise. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. 
So Francis understands that justification originates and is only made possible by God's grace and then is completed by her faith. So I want to look at faith. Okay, it's, it originates, justification originates with God's grace and it's completed by our faith. But faith has two elements. It has obedience, obedience to God's command, but it's also the trust in his grace to save us. So a lot of times we focus on the obedience part. We don't focus so much on the trust part. Um, so I think that the point is that sometimes we just have to trust in God. We don't really quite understand all of um, God's mind and his love, but we have to trust it. And that's what, that's what faith is. It's ob obedience and trust. So comparing the two belief systems, um, living by law, it's really kind of a checklist religion, right? Um, justified by completing the list of tasks, having enough check marks translates to me qualifying to go to heaven. So it's like a, like a qualifying meet, right? I've got to sort of finish in the top whatever to get to heaven. That's... That's how things are here, right? I've got to get to the top of the class or competition. But it's not that way with God. It's as if Christianity is something like in our workplace where there's a performance evaluation, right? And um, you're graded and measured and um, you're validated by your performance without really any reliance of mercy or grace. I mean, there's really not a whole lot of mercy and grace in the workplace. It's pretty straightforward, right? It's all pretty much performance-based, not mercy or grace-based. And so we get that mindset and we can bring it in for our Christian life. Um, kind of have this mindset, like if it's meant to be, it's, it's up to me. And um, I'm going to bring that into being a Christian. And I'm not against that mentality, but you have to balance that significantly with God's grace, because it's so much greater in scope than whatever you can do for God. God's done so much more for you than you could ever do for him. So your trust and your, your faith needs to be in his grace. So living by grace, let's see the things that this, this looks like, and it's very different. So living by grace recognizes that our role in salvation is not that of a justifier but that of a humble, grateful, and loving child. That's our role. And that's how we should approach our relationship with God. There's no checklists, hoops to jump through, guilt or struggles with our past failures while wrestling with perfection. Living by grace doesn't have those kind of characteristics. Living by grace understands obedience is required by God as a demonstration of faith and not as a means of qualification. Obedience comes naturally and is not guilt-driven. I'm not guilt, guilted into serving God. Um, and I'm not haunted by the question, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Um, and that doubt that continually gnaws at us, right? Well, maybe I'll, I will be if I can get to this level, if I can do these types of things. But we never quite get there, right? And we wonder, we read God's word and it feels like I can never be good enough. Um, living by grace doesn't do that. And then finally, um, living by grace doesn't rank or compare ourselves to others as a means of self-justification, either pointing to somebody that's doing more than us or somebody that's doing less than us, right? Because you can play with the game either way. I can point to somebody and say, well, I'm better than them, so I'm okay. Or I could beat myself up and say, I'm not like that person and I need to be but I never can get there. So therefore, I'm a failure, and I have all these feelings, right? And God's grace is nullified, and I'm dead in my sin. That's what the scripture says. So, um, so living by grace looks a lot different. And um, living by saving grace, Francis believes, since I'm a child of God, I will pray without ceasing, study God's word, pay whatever's owed, help in whatever way I can, Attend without forsaking. Forgive God. Forgive as God has forgiven me. And being justified by his grace, God will welcome me into heaven. So a little bit different approach, right? Um, when you're looking about how you interact with God, how you, how you serve him, those are some of the comparisons. 
Linda lives by law in an attempt to be justified before God. Francis lives by faith, which relies on God's gracious forgiveness for imperfect law-keeping. Linda serves God with her head, and Francis serves God with her heart. So sometimes we, in our head, understand what God's word wants us to do, but we don't quite understand with our heart. So there is a difference. Linda serves God um, like a cynical, world-weary adult, and um, Francis serves God with the open and trusting heart of a child. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus, Matthew 18, 1 and 3, Jesus, um, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, and Jesus said, who then is the greatest? Oh, at the time, Jesus, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set them before him, and he said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so... Um, we read about this and we talk about what that means, right? But it's, it's kind of this open, trusting um, attitude of a child in our approach to God. Not a cynical, world-weary adult, but somebody who has an open heart and a trusting faith in God, like a child. Because a child will just reach up to their parent and trust in them, right? So that's how we need to be with God. Um, not beaten down by the world or by our lack of being able to do some of the things that God wants us to do. One living by law um, can end up with the same actions and habits as somebody living by grace. So think about that. They may be doing the same exact thing. They may be attending. They may be praying. They may be studying. They may be doing all kinds of service to God. So the actions are all the same, but they're really for different reasons. Linda serves God out of fear of punishment from God. Francis out of love and appreciation for God's grace. He doesn't have to fear punishment. I mean, do you, do you feel that sometimes? I think we should. I mean, I don't think the Bible has it there for us in a certain sense. And if you think about when people are, are initially converted, and we certainly see that in the first sermon, right, in Acts chapter 2. People were convicted, and they, there was a fear but we're supposed to move beyond that. And in um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, the Apostle John says there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. So perfect love casts out the fear of punishment. And so we find ourselves struggling with that, we need to appreciate God's love and realize that when we're in God's love, we can cast out that fear. That's what the scripture's saying. That perfect love in God casts out fear. And um, Linda's just enslaved by fear and doubt. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, uh, the Hebrew writer says, Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might make free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. That's where Linda's at. She's in slavery. Slavery, fear of death, not good enough, not going to make it, and not really looking to God's grace and the power of that and the importance of that in her life. You see, Linda fears going to hell, while Francis dreams of being in heaven. So there's two different mindsets there. That's really what it comes down to. Do you fear going to hell, or do you dream about going to heaven? And one is based on living by law, and the other one is based on living by grace. So, any thoughts before we move on? So to finish up, um, living by law, just a couple more thoughts. It can produce a, a minimum and maximum kind of mindset. So what do I mean by that? Well, this, this little line right here. Uh, on the one side, the minimum, you know, I will do this much, right? 
but then I go over here, but I will know no more than this. That's the maximum. And we start to define our service to God that way, right? And when we have this idea that we're, we're really justified by what we do for God. And the problem with that is we choose what we'll do for God that fits really neatly into our comfort zone. Or that way with, as humans, right? Um, if I don't feel comfortable doing something, I won't do that because I'm choosing to do this. So living by, living by law will, will put us into those, and we'll, we'll want to define our roles. We'll want to define what it means to serve God. And instead of letting God um, choose that for us, we'll put limits in our love or service to God. So Ephesians chapter 2, um, and uh, verse 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 2, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Our lives to him as an offering and a sacrifice. And so when we try to put limits on that and say, no, I'm going to just do this, but I'm not going to do that. Um, in a sense, we're limiting that offering, um, which he gave to us in an unlimited way. We become like the Pharisees. Um, one more, one more, Hebrews 6 and verse 1. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on mature, to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. So we talked about this. Christina brought it up. Initially, right, we may feel like we need to live by law. We have to kind of follow God's law, and we don't quite understand his grace. But over time, we leave those elementary principles and we move on to maturity, to growth, to understanding God's grace. And it's, it's that we can really kind of appreciate and live like Francis lives when we get to that point. But if we stay in these comfort zones, we, we limit ourselves and we never grow past that elementary phase, um, much like the Pharisees. So um, they were wanting to serve God in a, in a very technical way, according to the law. And um, if you look at Jesus, what he had to say about them, Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe to you, Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these things are, these are all the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So those, those issues of mercy, justice, and faithfulness, that's really what's important to God. That's what's driving, or should be driving, you know, what you're doing for him versus trying to kind of follow technically the law. So Christ, he didn't say, I will do this much for mankind, but I will do no more than this. That's not how we approached it. And so that's really shouldn't, we shouldn't approach our service to God in that way. We should be open to grow and to become more faithful in his uh, in his service. So living by grace is love without limits. So think about that. Understanding that we participate in our salvation through faith, but we're not the reason for it. Um, we don't climb up the ladder of good works into heaven. Rather, God reaches down to us out of love as a father to carry us to heaven. So that is saving grace. All he asks is that we don't let go of his hand and trust in his power to deliver us. That is obedient faith. A little bit different way to think about grace and faith in that kind of a description. Um, again, trying to give an idea of what those look like for us in our Christian life. that Maybe we haven't looked at in quite that way. Living by grace gives us the freedom to engage in service to God from the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians um, 5, 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there's no law. So there's no law against these things. There's no, um, there's no limits. There's no um, impediments to any of this. Um, no one can legislate how often or how much we do these things or put any limits on them. They're free from measurements. Um, competition or comparison. So when we go back to getting outside of our comfort zone, we grow through the fruit of the Spirit. All of those things that are listed, if we're open to God 
Uh, we allow ourselves to grow and continue to grow. We don't stay stagnant in one spot and say, this is, I will only do this, but I will do no more than that. I realize over my life that I grow and I mature because these fruits of the Spirit provide that for me. And there's no limitation to it. And that's what God expects. Because when I have done that, that's when um, I can, can I truly have the peace of God talked about in Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your minds, your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How do I get that peace? Well, that's the process you go through. You let yourself develop through those fruits of the Spirit. And don't limit yourself to your self-defined works. and Stay within that comfort zone. You allow those fruits to expand your capacity to serve God and grow and appreciate and love him. And then the fullness of God. We know the love of God which surpasses knowledge, that you're to be filled up in the fullness of God. How do I get the fullness of God? I get it through this type of living by grace. How do I get it? I don't get it by trying to do more for God. I just get more discouraged. And at some point, I kind of just say, well, what's the point? I'm never going to be good enough. And that's unfortunately where Linda is, but Francis sees it differently. So living by grace looks a little different. It says, I will do whatever is necessary out of faith in God and gratitude for his grace. There's, there's no minimum or maximum. Right? I'll do whatever whatever's necessary. And I'll approach life that way. I'll be open. I realize where I'm at today, but I'll be open to grow. I may not be able to do that today, but I'll be open to the possibility of being able to do that tomorrow or the next day if God gives me the time. And I let the fruits of the Spirit develop within me and let that really um, mature me as a Christian. And that's how we grow, not through more attending or more study. I'm not against those things, right? But that's not how we grow. So, in conclusion, uh, living, in living by grace, Francis walks with determined faith, which guides her actions, fully trusting in God's saving grace to overcome her inadequacies, in, inadequacies and handle her sins. So that's what living by grace looks like. Um, so the question to conclude is, is, are you living your life more like Linda, or are you living your life more like Francis? Kind of think about that throughout the week. Um, I, I, I would say perhaps there's a little bit of Linda in all of us, even as we're trying to be more like Francis every day. Um, and hopefully this study can, can help us become more like Francis, uh, to appreciate God's grace and the power that it has and the scope of that being so much greater than what, what we ourselves think we're doing for God. Lupe. And I think that determination for it to truly be something that is rewarding has to come from love, right? And God, in his wisdom, he demonstrates his love by, by giving his son, but, but it's all encompassed in grace, right? When we really understand the concept of grace and what, what it does for us, and as we go on, we'll talk about how grace continues past our salvation. Um, that appreciation is, is love, and that love drives your determined faith. It doesn't come from a self-determined faith. It's, it's one that's, um, that's truly out of appreciation for God. And that, that really is the most powerful motivator of all of us, right? I mean, we, we only have so much self-will, right? I can only do so much. Um, how many of us can be perfect in everything that we do when we try to be right, but um, we know we fail? Um, why are there so many diets on the market today? Because they don't work, right? They would work if people just followed them. But we don't follow them because we don't have the will to do it. And so we fail. If we determine, we rely on our own will and try to use that for determined faith, we're going to fail. Um, 
And we're certainly going to fall short of what really God has as far as the fullness of God and the peace of God. We won't really know that. We'll just know guilt and frustration, doubt. And, um, you know, it all comes back to appreciating God's grace. I saw a hand somewhere. Justin. It's, it's counterintuitive. Sure. And it's counterintuitive to everything we do in this world. Everything we do in this world, we have to earn. And we're graded and we're measured and we're compared and we're ranked. And um, God's world is completely different. And it's so hard for us at times to, to approach God's word, world that way. But um, that's, that's why we need to continue the study. And through study comes faith. Through faith, you know, comes in a appreciation for God's grace. So, um, any other thoughts? We conclude. I really appreciate everybody's comments and, and attention. And next week, we're going to kind of transition from the foundation of grace, and we're going to look at some of our problems of resistance to grace. So there's some lessons that we're going to talk about, how we, we, we actually can resist God's grace and how that, how that happens, what it looks like. And... Um, we're going to talk about the problem of unbelief, how unbelief can be a, a resistance to God's grace. So um, look forward to getting together next week and talking about that. So great. Thank you, everybody. We're finishing up a few minutes early, too. Bonus. So. <laughs>